we know that with some primates, especially highly social primates, non-human primates, um, facial markings and pigmentation uh, and patterns influence how they communicate with each other. So if you have a brightly colored eyebrow, for example, or or cheeks that are bright colored and you puff them out, um, it can facilitate different communicative encounters. And so I wanted to know, do we see a similar trend with dogs? Because as we know, dogs are also super diverse in terms of what they look like and the coloring and the patterns that they have on their faces. Um, but instead of communicating with each other, I wanted to know what that re what it was like when they were communicating with people. Lo and behold, we do find that there is um, a statistically significant relationship between what the dog's faces look like and the number of, of movements they make or their perceived expressivity. And dogs with plainer faces tend to be slightly more expressive than those with more complex faces. And this is similar to some of the trends that we see in primates. We also found that older dogs tend to be less expressive in the face, um, which again, we kind of hypothesize that that may be you know, um, as dogs age, they can be in discomfort, so pain or discomfort can influence uh, the movements that they're wanting or willing to make. Um, it could also be that they don't have to try as hard. They've been around their people long enough to know that, oh, I can I can get you to pay attention to me, like, really easily without having to, to move my face around so much. Um, we found that dogs who are skilled working dogs and or have kind of advanced training also tend to be more expressive, which I think makes sense, right? If, if you're interacting really regularly with your human in a, in a context that demands fluent communication, you're, you're gonna pick up on those cues more. One of the things that really surprised me was that the dogs follow the same pattern as the non-human primates in terms of the planar faces being more expressive. And the reason that is counterintuitive to me is we, ha we have bred dogs to look a certain way, many certain ways, right? Breeds are, are distinguished by what they look like, and, and many people identify a breed not on their behavioral characteristics, though some, but, you know, the typical person in the street is like, oh, that's a collie, I know what a collie looks like, or a French bulldog, I know what a French bulldog looks like. Um, and they look very different, right? So dogs have been, have been bred to look physically or have very different facial appearances, um, but to all have similar behaviors in terms of attending to socializing with and communicating with people. So really, in my brain, as I started this, I was like, oh, it shouldn't make a difference what their faces look like. And so given the results that we, <laughs> that we found, I think it's probably more a matter of perception. So it's, it may be easier for us as humans, again, to see the, the, those expressions more clearly on a planar face because there's not as much what we call visual noise. Understanding how dogs are communicating with us is super important because they are, they fill so many roles within human society, right? They are probably the closest to wild that, <laughs> that we get. I mean, obviously, you know, we, there are, there's tons of urban wildlife, people have cats, there are domestic animals of all kinds, um, but dogs are really integrated into our society in ways that many animals are not. Um, and so understanding how they're communicating with us enables that relationship to be a positive one. Um, we anticipate them, you know, understanding us and we, we kind of make them learn our, our ways. Dogs can learn, you know, over a thousand words and we know of one that has learned over a thousand words in the English language anyway. Um, so they're incredibly adept at um, adapting to our our modes of communication, but we should really return the favor if we want to get the most out of the relationship and see the best outcomes for them in a human society, right? Because that's not, well, you could debate whether that's a natural environment <laughs> for them or not. Um, but if we think about welfare contexts, if we think about uh, dogs in shelters, if we think about working dogs, you know, service animals, um, if we think about just, you know, your regular interactions with dogs in your neighborhood, people at a dog park, knowing what they're thinking or feeling or what cognitive processes are going on for them 
really can help us to enhance their experience and ours when they're around. For example, I like to tell people a lot, and you know, it's a little bit different when we're talking about dog-dog communication and dog-human communication, for sure. Um, but there are very distinct cues that a dog can make with their face that are telling you something deliberate. And in the case of a dog park, I find so often that if, if, if the human companions were a little bit more tuned in to those expressions, we could avoid a fight, we can avoid a bite, we can avoid you know, just a negative interaction um, by being a little bit more aware of how they're, how they're talking to us.